this whole s uh, sub, U-boat sub, is, is a great story. And we're going to tell it this evening from some wonderful people. Uh, the, um, the program is going to be led by Dr. Randy Bradham, whose books uh, were mentioned by Axel. And we have a group of uh, veterans who were there and will give their stories. And I, I, I do want to tell you one thing, though. Every one of these guys is going to say, I won the war, and it was a team effort. Dr. Randy Bradham. Uh, first of all, I want to express my appreciation to uh, Don for all the good work that he's done in bringing uh, these wonderful veterans together. Uh, and I want to express my appreciation to all of you for coming, because by coming to a meeting like this, you honor all of those soldiers who did not return, and I'm always very grateful for that. Now, uh, I'm going to uh, sort of give you a run through uh, Brittany first with the submarine campaign and with the bombardments of the submarine pens. And then uh, after that, uh, we'll uh, end that in 1943, and then we'll skip up to uh, uh, Normandy and uh, discuss the Battle of Normandy, not the beachhead, but the Battle of Normandy. We'll run, that, uh, run through that fairly quickly, and then we'll have these other good speakers to uh, take my place. First of all, I want to make a little review of the, uh, what uh, was a prelude to uh, the uh, battle in Brittany. As you know, the uh, Germans invaded France <clears throat> on uh, May the 10th, 1940. And uh, at that time, Paul Renaud was the minister of uh, uh, France, and he resigned and he turned it over to Marshal Henri Philippe Pétain. Pétain was a hero in France, and uh, he was the uh, a hero of Verdun, well respected. He had stayed in the government since World War I and was now uh, heading up France. Uh, later, uh, he gave way to uh, Laval, uh, and uh, they, at the time that the Germans moved into France, they moved the government of France to Bordeaux. Then on uh, 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 May the, uh, let's see, no, it was on June the um, 17th, they uh, met and they decided that uh, they'd had enough and they would sign an armistice, which they did on June the 18th. On that same day, June 18th, or that evening, uh, de Gaulle made his famous speech to the people of France, uh, uh, encouraging them to continue the war and uh, not sign an armistice. The armistice was signed on June 18th, and it went into effect on uh, June the 25th. Uh, now, uh, I want to uh, review a little bit of France and uh, then tell you what happened as soon and show you what happened as soon as the uh, uh, Germans occupied France. All right, here's the, uh, which, now which button, John? John, which button that button? Do forward right there. I'm obviously not high tech. <laughs> okay. See, I, I do have to tell you, he, he does have a talent. He's a retired cardiovascular surgeon. <laughs> uh, very tired. Uh, uh, I can't spell it now. <laughs> okay, the uh, next uh, slide here uh, shows that when the Germans came in, they occupied three-fifths of France. And you see that the bottom part that is not occupied is in the southern and central part. Now, the, um, getting back to this high tech, let me cut this thing on. Okay, Don. <laughs> well, you're asking the. There you go. Okay, all right. Push that button right there. Kind of hard. Okay. Uh, okay, now what I want to show you here this is the Atlantic Wall, and uh, this was very heavily fortified. The Tote Organization, which was a big construction uh, outfit in Germany, came in and did the Atlantic Wall. Uh, Hitler made uh, Marshal von Rundstedt 
head of the development of the Atlantic Wall. Rundstedt didn't have any faith in it, and so finally Hitler replaced uh, him as head of the Atlantic Wall with General Rommel. Okay, uh, now eventually in 1942, that unoccupied portion would become occupied. Now here's the uh, area that we're gonna be speaking of. Uh, here's Normandy and here's Brittany. And as you know, the beaches were right here, Utah and Omaha were right here, and then the sword and uh, Juno were down here. Uh, the area that we're gonna concentrate on is first is the uh, uh, Brittany area. Uh, this shows a little bit about a picture of the uh, Normandy, uh, his invasion, his Normandy, his Brittany. Now, right here, uh, right here is Cherbourg at the tip of the uh, Cotentin Peninsula, which is part of Normandy. Saint Malo, we'll be talking about, is here. Brest is here. Lorient is here. And Saint Nazaire is here. These were all five bastions, and Hitler made the commanders of these uh, bastions promise that they were to defend to the last man. He chose these uh, generals uh, personally, and uh, that was their a vow to him that they would do. All right, and a little bit about the idea of Brittany. Uh, here is Wren, uh, Wren, which is the sort of capital of, uh, uh, Wren, of, of Brittany. And you'll hear more about that later from a nice French lady, Janique, who's sitting here. Uh, here again is Brest, Saint-Malo, Lorient, and uh, uh, saint Nazaire. Uh, Cherbourg is off the screen now. This is the pocket of Lorient, La Poche Lorient, as the French would say. Uh, what you see here is a perimeter that we eventually occupied to contain Lorient because uh, General Bradley and, and General Eisenhower decided we had lost so many men at Cherbourg, Saint Malo, and Brest that we were going to contain rather than try to take these pockets. And uh, with, the, uh, with infantry divisions and with the help of the Free French of the Interior, we were able to contain them uh, for the entire war. Uh, this is Saint Nazaire. And uh, the uh, San Jose again uh, has its border. This is this, this is the not not Brass Canal. This is the Valaine River here, and here's the Loire River. Now here's San Jose. It's about five miles in from the coast, and you, I'm gonna tell tell you a little bit more about this Loire estuary when I uh, tell you about a daring raid on a dry dock there. Again, uh, our troops were along this line. The uh, Free French of the Interior occupied this uh, part south of the uh, Loire River and were tremendous help to us. I'll tell you more about the Free French in just a little bit. Now, this uh, is a, a peninsula between, it's a Kiberon Peninsula and it's between San Jose and Lorient. Uh, it was fortified with guns. It projects way out in the Bay of Biscay, and it protected both of those. It was close to both, and it protected uh, uh, both of them from any uh, invasion by the sea. These uh, uh, U-boat fortresses were very important to Hitler because the submarines were his most formidable we weapon. Uh, they ended up sinking uh, 8,000 of our ships, and that accounted for uh, almost a million men that were sent to the bottom of the Atlantic. They uh, brought England to their knees in 1940, 41, before we came into the war. All right, now this is the, uh, uh, the submarine pens at Lorient. Let me see if I can get this one back. Nope, I have to keep going. This thing doesn't back up. 
I'll try not to do that again. Go back one more. Yeah. The no, one more. One more. Yeah. Okay, good. All right, now the, the, the top one is the one I did. Okay, these are the submarine pens at um, uh, San Jose, and they would house 20 submarines. Uh, they were, uh, there were some submarine pens there before that the French had built, but they completely redid these. All right, the next one is the ones at Lorient. You can uh, see how much cement and how thick these things are. Now, because of these uh, two fortresses, uh, the uh, English decided to start bombardment, and they started that in 1940. Uh, this is an aerial photo of the ones at uh, Lorient, and this is uh, called the Caraman Peninsula, and they had Caraman 1, Caraman 2, Caraman 3. In that order, the uh, 20 more submarine pens were built. They also had two cathedral bunkers, and the cathedral bunkers had a steep, uh, a steep ceiling, and the bombs would bounce off of them rather than explode. They also had four more bunkers on the uh, Scarf River. Uh, this is the estuary. Here's the sea. We're coming in to the Loire River here. Now, I'm going to tell you about a raid in a, a, down the pike a bit. And the raid uh, was, here are the submarine pens here. Uh, but the uh, raid was on a dry dock that would, it was Old Normandy Dry Dock. And uh, its uh, formal name was Formy Clus Louis Joubert. And he was the uh, uh, head of uh, San Jose at one time, the mayor or some other, uh, in, or in some other capacity but mainly known as the Normandy Dock, and it was where the uh, Normandy uh, ship, which was a transatlantic uh, liner, was uh, uh, put in for repairs. Uh, this is uh, not very good, but this is a picture of, General, of uh, Admiral uh, Donitz and uh, General Rommel inspecting the troops there. Uh, Admiral uh, Donitz was a submarine in World War I. He was captured and kept in prison for a while. Uh, and he was a, a mastermind. And the Germans weren't supposed to develop any submarines, but they did so sub rosa with a Dutch outfit. So in 1935, when they were allowed to have submarines again, uh, they uh, already had one ready to go. So they started developing submarines and in the first uh, year uh, of the war with uh, England, they sunk a thousand ships. At that time, and they only had six submarines uh, which were operational in uh, the Atlantic. At that time, uh, it was sort of a shooting gallery. There weren't any convoys. Uh, there wasn't any protection for these merchant ships. And these uh, submarines just went out there and knocked them off. Now, as soon as uh, the uh, the uh, pens were built at San Jose and Lorient. Uh, Donitz moved all of his submarines down from the Baltic ports, such as Bergen and, and Tri Trinum, and so they had uh, uh, they cut off 450 miles to the Atlantic Ocean. Sitting where they were at San Jose and Lorient, they were right on the Atlantic Ocean, and uh, 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 the trip out and back was uh, much less. Now, this is a, a compilation here of the top 10 aces, and this is a tonnage each one of them sunk, and these are the number of ships they sunk. These 10 guys sunk over uh, 300 ships. Uh, the one up, uh, the amazing thing to me is uh, the top one up here, uh, Crutchmeyer, uh, he was captured in 1941, so he was only in the game for about a year, and uh, he did pretty well. Yeah. Now, I just wanted to show this while we were talking about submarines, because uh, Hank Anderson's going to talk about this. But uh, this is a picture of the uh, HMS Cheshire, and then this is a picture of the boat that Hank was on, the Leopoldville, which was sunk. These were pre-war pictures, and I just threw them in here so you'll get a, a peek at them.
All right, now, I want to tell you about a very daring raid. It was called Operation Chariot. It was designed by Lord Lewis Mountbatten. Uh, they wanted to uh, obliterate or wreck the Normandy dock. And so they uh, uh, turned this over to Louis Mountbatten, and he made this daring plan. It involved about 300 commandos and about 300 naval personnel. They trained uh, very hard in England for a long period of time. And the, the uh, plan was to take uh, 16 small boats. Uh, they got an old destroyer from the United States. We called it the Buchanan. It was one of those 50 that uh, uh, Roosevelt gave to uh, Churchill. And, but they, they uh, changed the name to the uh, Campbelltown. Well, the plan was is to fill the Campbelltown full of <clears throat> munitions, and they had some very expert people doing that. They were going to tow it to San Jose with uh, another destroyer, and uh, they were going to drive it. Uh, after they got it towed there, they were going to drive it in to that dock, and with uh, delayed uh, uh, explosives, all the uh, people on the boat would get off. Now, accompanying this uh, uh, two destroyers, one towing the other, uh, was uh, 16 uh, boats uh, that were called motor launches. They were 128 feet long, 18 feet wide, made out of plywood or some similar wooden. I don't guess it's plywood then, but they were wooden, and they contained petrol. Well, you could, you know, you could sort of sink one of them with a firecracker because they were very vulnerable to any damage. But on these uh, 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 motor launches were the commandos and the naval personnel and the munitions experts and all the, uh, everybody was formed into teams. They all had a plan. They had gone over the uh, maps and all of the dock there very well, and they were uh, very well prepared to do their job. Here's an uh, estuary again. They were supposed to get there at 1.30 on March the 28th, 1942. And it was interesting that Donuts was there inspecting the uh, 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 two uh, areas at the time. And his two flotilla commanders, one of them was named Sola and the other one was named Schultz. And he asked uh, Sola, he said, uh, Sola, what would you do if the uh, British attacked this uh, port? And Sola said, well, I think that's highly unlikely, uh, Admiral Donitz. And uh, Donitz said, well, I wouldn't be. I, I failed to mention that uh, one, there was another boat, a uh, motor gun boat, and another one, a motor torpedo boat. So they had 19 boats altogether. Each one of them had its own mission. So uh, the RAF was going to start bombing San Jose at 11.30 on March 27th, which they did. They uh, had bad weather, so they didn't drop a lot of bombs. But uh, almost uh, with magic, this flotilla of boats uh, got here on time, and they, uh, the borders of this estuary were lined with gun emplacements. And uh, they had the uh, destroyer, the uh, uh, Campbelltown, dressed up as a German warship. And so they got all the way in, and they uh, crashed the gate of the dock at uh, 1.34. It was uh, time to be there. The time was 1.30, and they made it at 1.34 in the morning of March 28th. It had delayed uh, explosives in it, and the next day all the Germ uh, Germans were sort of gawking over it, and the darn thing blew up and it scattered Germans everywhere. Some of them even had their girlfriends there. All right, now this uh, shows the path of these boats that went in. The, uh, they they uh, entered at three different uh, landing sites, and the uh, commandos were discharged. The commandos immediately went to work uh, wrecking the place. They had a very bitter fight, and uh, most of them were killed or captured. 
Uh, this is the dock. Uh, it was, it's about as long as a football field, not quite as wide as a football field. It could be filled or drained in 14 hours. This shows the uh, uh, destroyer that they rammed in there sitting on top of the, one of the caissons, one of the entrances to the uh, dock. There's some Germans here. It blew up the uh, next day. Now, this is one of the most remarkable photos I've ever seen. These are some of the uh, commandos that were captured. Uh, and here are a bunch of German officers saluting them. They were respected their bravery so much. There was a, as a a little wooden boats were escaping, which very few of them did. Uh, one of them was attacked by uh, a German destroyer, and he decided he'd fight it out with a German destroyer. Well, he was uh, immediately sunk, but the German uh, commander of the destroyer picked up every dead and uh, live uh, Englishman out of the water, which was unusual for them to do. He gave them the best medical care in the world, and he had a tremendous respect for them. Now, this is a, a list of the boats, and, and you see that only three of them got back to England. The rest of them were lost in this battle, but it was one of the most daring battles uh, that uh, uh, I've seen recorded in uh, World War II. Uh, now, I just wanted to give a, a little bit, uh, a few th uh, stats on the uh, submarines and what they uh, did. I've got a lot of statistics in my book, but I just picked out a few things that I would mention. First of all, on October 1940, uh, Convoy SC-30 was attacked by a wolf pack. Now, uh, Admiral Donitz had his submarines hunting in wolf packs. If one of them would come across a convoy, then uh, he would radio to Donitz. Donitz was in personal contact with all these submarines, and he'd tell them where and when and how far, uh, how fast the convoy was going. And they'd, uh, they would uh, group around in packs and attack these convoys. The English stuck to the convoy system and were using it. We didn't use it at first, and we uh, finally uh, learned a lesson. Now, that uh, night, the uh, wolf pack out of this convoy uh, sunk 15 of 35 ships. The, next, the very next night, they found another convoy and uh, they, uh, of about 30 ships, and they sunk 12 of those. No U-boats were lost. The uh, German submariners called this the happy times. Between September 1939 and uh, June 1940, uh, 2,300,000 uh, 2, tons uh, of Allied shipping was lost. Uh, July 1940 to uh, December 1940, uh, 2,500,000 tons were lost. During this time, and up till this time, uh, up to June 1940, only two uh, U-boats had been sunk. So uh, we weren't doing too well. Uh, May 1942, uh, 120 Allied vessels were sunk in May, and 119 were sunk in June. Uh, on June 1942, there was a convoy, Q-17, headed to Russia. Uh, 35 merchant ships. There were 47 escorts. Uh, somebody spotted the Tirpitz, which was one of their big battleships, and said, the Tirpitz is headed for your convoy, and the order was given, everybody disperse each boat to its own, uh, which was a dreadful mistake. Only 11 of these 35 ships uh, finally reached the Russian port. Uh, well, going on down the line, things began to get better in 1943, uh, we learned how to fight the submarines better, and so did the uh, British. Uh, the technical aspect of it uh, improved remarkably. We used the convoy system. We were able to develop more uh, uh, escort boats, and the, the troops were, I mean, the cr crews were much better trained. Uh, 
In April of 1943, 15 U-boats were sunk. In May of 1943, 40 U-boats were sunk. And at this time, uh, we were sinking more of their U-boats than they could produce. At this time, we had replaced all of the thousand, uh, uh, all of the ships that we had lost up until 1943 uh, by the German U-boats. Uh, now, when, you know, there's 15 ships in April, I mean, 15 U-boats sunk in, in May and 40 sunk in, uh, I mean, April and, and 40 sunk in May, we saw like Brett Favre throwing two touchdown passes. I, I hope he will do that. <laughs> now, now, we, now, one other thing I want to tell you is that we replaced all of this which was an uh, example of the production in this country at this time. It was, it was just unimaginable, the production that this country uh, did to keep that, to win that war. And you might not believe this, but they did all of it without a stimulus package. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But those were good times. That's when Mrs. Got Rocks was in the kitchen making bandages with her maid. Her maid's son was probably in the Pacific and Ms. Godrock's son was probably in the Air Force somewhere overseas. People really worked together, pulled together, and that's what makes this country so great. Okay, now let's see where we go. Now, because of this menace of the new boat, uh, Churchill and um, Roosevelt decided uh, to start bombing. The British started bombing it in 1940. We joined them in 1942. At the Casablanca Conference in 1943, uh, Churchill and Roosevelt got together and said, we're going to step up the bombing on uh, San Jose and Lorient. Okay, now this is some of the destruction. I'm going to show you a few pictures. Uh, just to uh, let you see what has happened. This destruction is in the two pockets that I showed you, San Jose and Lorient. Uh, there were a lot of wayward bums. We didn't have any smart bums in. We had young pilots, some of them 20, 21 years old, who had never been in combat. There was bad weather a lot of times in Brittany. Uh, they were flying uh, a high at about 20 or 25,000 feet, so there was a lot of scattering of bombs. Uh, a lot of the, the pictures that I show you uh, are in the little surrounding villages and towns, not just in the uh, streets of San Jose and Lorient. And you can see this terrible destruction. Now what happened? We killed a lot of Frenchmen. Uh, the first uh, raid that, uh, that the United States made was on November 9, 1942. And we killed 186 French people that day with the bombing. Uh, we destroyed all of the houses. Uh, in, uh, uh, on uh, February the 4th, 7th, 13th, and 16th of 1943, uh, Lorient was bombed, and 104 people were lost. 60,000 incendiary bombs were dropped in one month at that time. 5,000 uh, bombs, uh, large bombs, were uh, dropped in one month. 30,000 buildings were destroyed, and Lorient was, produced, uh, was reduced 90% uh, of houses, stores, hospitals, and everything. Now, uh, Lorient was bombed 300 and something times and San Jose was bombed 177 times. San Jose was called the uh, uh, Flax City by the airmen. When uh, Hank and I were there uh, uh, guarding these places, they just turned those AK -AC guns around on us because they weren't shooting at planes then. San Jose and Lorient, you can see the pitif pitiful effect that it had on these people. Our homes are gone no water, no food, no hospital facilities. And uh, the hard thing about it was, as much bombing as we did, we didn't knock out one submarine. 
we didn't kill one submariner, and we didn't put a dent in either one of these uh, uh, U-boat pens. You can go over them to this day, and you can't, the only chink I ever saw was on one of them over in Lorient, but the rest of them, uh, they're just completely undamaged, and business went on as usual. We didn't stop anything. Now, I'm sure that if our press got a hold of that these days, there would be, a, be some raucous, but anyway, that's the way it went. Okay, now, uh, I just wanted to show this because uh, these are the marquee. Marquee means uh, it refers to a brush-covered field where you can hide. And I think it was originated when the Corsicans were fighting the Germans, and the Corsicans ran them out of Corsica. Uh, but they were uh, called the marquee, and they're much like, they were much like uh, our militia during the Revolutionary War. who were farm boys that just sort of got together, and uh, they would get together in little villages, then one village would join with the next, and they would build up bigger and bigger units. And uh, the uh, French resistance uh, uh, would, uh, get in would get in touch with these people and form, an, form them into about a unit. They would give them about five days training and a rifle, and they were the free French of the interior. And they, uh, by the time we got to saint Nazaire and Lorient, in the ground war, there were about 40,000 uh, members there, which were pretty well organized. And then the uh, uh, infantry units that went in there, the 83rd, the uh, 94th, and my division, the 66th, trained them, but they, uh, they gave us a lot of help and fought very hard for the honor of their country. Uh, they looked like something out of a movie, I might say. And they liked to do two things, and one of them was smoke, and the other one was to kill Germans. What? Yeah, and drink wine. <laughs> a lot of them did not have a uniform, but then two days later you'd see him, and he had a uniform. And where he got it, he killed a German, and he died at a different color, and that was his uniform. <laughs> uh, now this is, uh, this is interesting. This is a Panhard armored car. And the French had Panhard armored cars when Germany came in uh, to France. And they took them all from the French. Then the French, uh, after the invasion, took them back from the Germans. So now they're sporting around in their Panhard armored cars. And there's the Cross of Lorraine on, on this one. So they were pretty uh, cagey about uh, uh, retaliating against the Germans. Now, one thing I do want to add about the uh, French resistance, and I'll just throw this in, I've had a lot of interest in the French resistance, and uh, it, it differed a lot uh, from the Marquis on up to uh, 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 more organized units, and there were a lot of organizations in the French resistance of all nationalities. Uh, they had Spaniards, they had uh, uh, Czechs, they had Slovaks, they had Polish, they had Jews, and uh, uh, the reason that the Jews went it, uh, they were against the Vichy government as much as they were against the Germans. And the Vichy government of France uh, sent a lot of Jews to the concentration camps, and they also sent a lot of young guys to uh, obligatory uh, work camps for the Germans. So they were really a collaborationist outfit. And one reason there were so many young guys in the Marquis of French Resistance was that they, uh, if they didn't do that, they would be sent to these work camps. So they were avoiding these uh, uh, work camps. Uh, now, okay. Now, uh, what I want to show you now, we're going to, the, the bombing stopped in 1943. And uh, the uh, planes went, uh, started uh, the missions uh, uh, to bomb Germany in preparation for the invasion. So we're going to uh, get out of Brittany now. We're going to come back to it. And uh, here is a picture of uh, the Cotentin Peninsula uh, where the invasion took place. And uh, this is a little better picture of it uh, showing, uh, let me get my marker here.
here's the invasion force, and the first uh, mission was to, for the 4th uh, Infantry Division, to cross several bridges here and start towards Sherberg. If we were going to have this campaign uh, towards Germany, we had to have a port. Uh, the uh, uh, bad storm in the English Channel, June 18th and 19th, wrecked one of the uh, fabricated harbors and wrecked uh, everything there, and it was a long time before we could bring supplies back in uh, to uh, uh, supply the units. Now, as soon as uh, the invasion uh, happened, the day after, the uh, uh, 7th Corps, uh, which was under the uh, uh, command of uh, General Joe Collins, started up to Sherburg. The uh, part of it started at Sherburg, and part of it uh, tried to come across the uh, peninsula here to um, cut off the Germans from escaping and also to defend uh, the uh, attacking forces from any more influx of the Germans. There are, let me see if I can, okay. Now, there are two roads here that come in. Uh, this is uh, Highway National 13. It goes all the way from St. Mary Glees on up to uh, Sherburg. And that was a route that the uh, uh, outfits, it was the 79th Division, the 4th Division, and the uh, 9th Division were headed for Sherburg. And it was those three divisions which fought, fought at Sherburg. Two of our uh, uh, worst battles were trying to get across the Murder Ray River. Let me see if I have a better picture of that. Okay, here it is here. Uh, here's the Murder Ray River. Here's the Duve River. Here's uh, St. Mary Glees over here. Here's Lafayette Causeway. Here's the Chef Dupont Causeway. Some of you probably never heard of those two causeways, but those were two of the bloodiest battles that we had in World War II. Uh, General Anthony uh, McAuliffe, who was the uh, fellow at Bastogne, which said nuts to the Germans, he was here and he said that these two battles were worse than Bastogne. Now the reason was that the Germans had flooded this area. And this was very low, very swamp, uh, swampy. And uh, the, uh, to get across to the west side of the peninsula and cut it off like they planned, they had to get across this causeway and that causeway. And the, there was no protection. And they, uh, um, the artillery came in and they, uh, they powdered this area pretty well. But then the infantry started and they ran across these causeways, it had no cover at all. And the Germans started shooting them with machine guns and mortars and they were uh, just literally rolling off these causeways into the marsh and into the water. Terrible fight. And uh, finally, uh, they prevailed. And uh, it was the uh, commanders there, General Ridgway, General Maxwell Taylor, General Anthony McAuliffe, and James Gavin, uh, who were there standing on these causeways, pushing these guys and getting them to go. And they did a very good job. Of it. They finally established a beachhead on the other side of the rivers uh, and eventually got across. After that, the, uh, the uh, 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 7th Corps, with, uh, under General uh, Joe Collins, went on up to Sherburg and finally took Sherburg on June the uh, 27th after a very bitter fight. The commander up there was uh, General von Schlieben, and he was uh, uh, one of these dedicated to Hitler people who had uh, dedicated that he would, dedicated to Hitler that he would fight to the last man. Now this is the Fear Causeway uh, right here. Uh, here's the river. And uh, I've stood right there. Here's the Murray River right here. This is the causeway. All of this was flooded. Uh, it was a little uh, village on the other side, and that's where the Germans were holding out. As you can see, all this was hedgerow country, or what the French call the Bocage country. Very difficult to fight offensively and very good to fight in defensively. 
because you could uh, you could be behind these hedgerows and the offensive people had to attack with all of these uh, installations behind these hedgerows. Uh, so that, uh, if you look at it now, I visited there, very peaceful river. The day I was there, there was a fellow there. Middleton, I think, had more combat time in World War II than any other general. And they were both superb generals, and you hear very little about them, but I certainly want to do them justice. Uh, once this was established, then there was a lot better defense against Germans uh, infiltrating this area, and there were a certain number that were entrapped. Those that had gotten out, uh, most of them went to Saint Malo, uh, Lorient, Brest, Saint Nazaire, and uh, they resupplied those bastions with more soldiers to fight the Americans again. This is one of the many thousands of gun emplacements that was on the Atlantic Wall. Now, you know, war can go on, but kids are kids. And these two little fellows are happy. They stole a couple of jerry cans, and they're very proud of their accomplishment. Uh, I believe that's, uh, yeah, Sherberg. And uh, there was a, a bit of fight here. There was a Fort de Rule there. And there were two uh, Medal of Honor uh, winners uh, fighting in the Fort de, uh, de Rule. They really had to blast their way, way into it uh, with bazookas and everything and go from room to room and finally uh, capturing uh, Sherberg. It was finally captured, I think, I think von Schlieben surrendered on June the 27th. These are some of the prisoners of war from uh, Sherberg. Here's a dead fellow, a fellow dead at his post, and there were many of them. When the GIs finally got into Fort Rule, there were many of them uh, dead at the post. There were 2,000, and they were wounded and needed medical care. This is von Schlieben uh, with uh, some of the Americans. Uh, one of the uh, uh, German generals, I don't think it was von Schlieben, I think it was uh, one at Saint Malo or somewhere else, uh, when he surrendered, he asked the uh, American general, he said, what authority do you have to accept my surrender? And there were about five or six GIs slouched around with rifles on their shoulders. And he turned to them and he said, this is my authority. So that pretty well took care of the German general. Uh, some more prisoners being uh, taken off uh, the beach uh, at uh, uh, Normandy after they had been captured at Cherbourg. This is La Haye de Puy, and the dark areas are the high ground. A very bit of battle at La Haye de Puy because the Germans had the high ground. Uh, casualties there, and at Cherbourg, Saint Malo, and Brest were all running 50%. We lost a lot of people at all of these uh, bastions. All right, now this is Operation Cobra. Uh, Bradley wanted to get out of Normandy. It was almost two months now they'd been in Normandy. He wanted to break his way out. Uh, he waited until he had uh, the Germans outnumbered with tanks five to one. He, uh, media, uh, he wanted to uh, have this breakout area on the San Lo to Coutance, his Coutance here, uh, on this road, uh, but he finally decided on uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, San Lo Perrier Road. He mapped out a place three and a half miles long and one and a half mile wide, and that was going to be carpet bombed. Uh, that was going to be bombers coming over for five or six hours, obliterating the place. Well, the first day they did it was on June, uh, on uh, July the 24th. And that day, the weather was bad, and they had to turn the planes back. But some of them didn't get the message and went on and dropped their bombs. Unfortunately, there were short bombs, and there were a lot of casualties in the 30th Infantry Division. The next day, they repeated the uh, attack with the bombers, and unfortunately, again, there were short bombs. And that was the day that General Leslie McNair, who was uh, 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 an observer there, he was the uh, chief of procurement of soldiers for our army. He was killed 
uh, on that day, as well as uh, quite a few soldiers. The, this plan worked, and uh, the infantry was there. Uh, the 30th Infantry was there, and I forgot the other infantry division, but they poured through the gap, and then the 4th and 6th Armored uh, came in behind them, and that was the breakout and, uh, from Normandy, uh, which would... Uh, this is, a, this is a German soldier digging his way out after Operation Cobra. And they found a lot of them in there that were dead and half dead. All right, um, well, let me see what we got here. That's okay. It's upside down if that's the way they're going in, Avranche. Oh, okay. All right. So uh, the, the gateway to Brittany was Avranche. And we have a gentleman here tonight that's going to talk about that. And uh, once the 4th, uh, on uh, August the First, uh, the Third Army was uh, committed, and General Patton uh, was commander of the Third Army. He had two very fine armored units, the Fourth and uh, Sixth Armored Division, and uh, they broke uh, through Avranche and they cut a swath through Brittany. The Fourth went to um, Rennes, and the Sixth went to uh, uh, Brest. Another, this is a picture you saw many times. The GIs were good to the kids in Europe, and I've seen many of them take the hard candy out of the K-ration and put it in their pocket, and I knew what they were doing. They were collecting that, and they would give it to the kids when they saw them. And uh, they, were, they would save the chocolate for the kids, they'd save the hard candy for them, and they were very good to the children. Uh, let me see what, oh, that's Sam Malow, I believe in it. Yep. Okay. Uh, well, we have a, a gentleman here from the 83rd Division. The 83rd Division took uh, Sam Malow, and I'm going to let him tell you about that. Uh, again, there are about 50% casualties at Sam Malow. Okay, now this is the final surrender, and this was at San Isaiah. And uh, this was uh, General uh, Junk uh, 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 surrendering to uh, my commander, General Kramer. That was on May the 11th, uh, 1945, and that brought peace to uh, Brittany. That uh, does me, and I'll turn it over to you. Well, I'm a native Minnesotan, born in Hector, Minnesota, went to high school in Glencoe, Minnesota, and worked in a defense plant in Minneapolis for Minneapolis Moline, starting when I was barely 19 years old. Uh, I worked there a year and was drafted. The military decided they wanted me in uniform. Uh, I was drafted on March 24, 1943. I went to Fort Snelling and was there probably a week, and we were then sent to Fort Sheridan, Illinois, where I had basic training. I was at, in Illinois, became a member of the 777th, we called it the Triple Hooks, anti-aircraft battalion. And uh, you might say, what are we doing in Illinois? We used to call Great Lakes Naval Station, have them tow a sleeve up along the coast of Lake Michigan, and then we practice shooting at that sleeve. Uh, I reflect that our battalion was about one-third upper Midwest people I think they figured that we were duck hunters <laughs> and might be semi-qualified. <laughs> when the pilots were towing this 600-foot rope in a sleeve behind them, all they saw was the, we were leading the sleeve like you lead a duck. <laughs> and so the pilot saw the tracers coming right for him. 
And he'd make about two passes and he'd radio back and say he was having engine problem. <laughs> uh, I was one of those making the phone calls. I was in the operations, planning, training, and operations section. Uh, we did that for about three months in Fort Sheridan. Then we were transferred to Camp Campbell, Kentucky for armored training. I understand that's now a fort. Fort. The yeah. difference I learned many years later, a fort is a permanent installation. A camp is not necessarily permanent. Um, we took our armored training and uh, every place in Kentucky and Tennessee, when you drove a tent stake, after about a three inch penetration, you hit some shale. So we kind of forgot the tents for two months. <laughs> then we were transferred to Fort Davis, North Carolina. And why we went to the seashore, I have no idea, but again, we did a lot of practice firing. Uh, after just over a year, we got our first furlough. And following the furlough, re we reported to Camp Kilmer, New Jersey. We sailed out of New York on April 18th, 1944. We were on the New Amsterdam, which was the fourth largest ship. It held about 2,000 civilians and we had 8,800 troops on it. Uh, they had amateur, this is one thing I remember, they had amateur night. We had some southern boys who sang to the guitar, cool, cool water. We were traveling all alone, and somehow that stuck in my mind. <laughs> we landed in Scotland, in western Scotland, in a place called Gurick. And then we immediately marched uphill to the train and went to southern England and were assigned air defense of three different troop carrier bases. Um, we did that and never shot at a German plane because this was in late April and May before D-Day. On D-Day night, we two of us came out of the movie the Air Force movie, June 5th, about midnight, and here came a convoy of sirens and motorcycles, and Jeep, and Eisenhower. I could have stuck my hand out if he stuck his out, and I would have touched him. That was about 11.30. 12 o'clock, all the engines revved up, and the paratroops took off for Normandy. After a few days, I guess they didn't know what to do with us, so they sent us to Ashford, England to shoot at V-1 rockets. And uh, we quickly learned you don't hit them incoming, <laughs> you hit them outgoing. Um, I was printer killed twice right in England. I won't go into the details, but we fired at those, I suppose, for a couple weeks. Came back to southern England, went into a marshalling area, and uh, all of our insignia, our numbers, everything was blanked out, covered up, and eventually we got on an LST-497. I still to this day can't tell you what port I sailed out of. But we landed in Normandy, drove off in the water on July 20th. And the first town we came to was St. Mary Gleese. And uh, I'll move faster now. No, let's stop right there. All right. Because we're going to come back uh, after that. Okay. Uh, uh, I, I do want to prompt Merrill on one thing. You still have a souvenir. Tell us about your V1 souvenir that you got. Uh, V1, when the motor quit, 
you covered your ears because you knew that V1 was going to come down. And one landed about 300 feet from us. We were in a little woods. It landed on the edge of the woods, uh, dug a crater about 60 feet across, 30 feet deep, and killed a half a dozen cows. And I rushed over to the crater, and it was just hot and smoking. And I thought, I'm going to get a souvenir. So guess what? I spied the fuel injection nozzle. I climbed down in the crater and unscrewed that thing, and I had it in my trophy case. Thank you. And this had a, it's a thousand pound bomb, incidentally, pilotless with a, a pulse engine. And uh, when a thousand pound bomb goes off that close to you, it knocks all the leaves off the trees, knocked us all flat on our backs. And I have some hearing aids that help as a result of that. I, I grew up in St. Paul, Minnesota. That's uh a ways from here, and uh, my uh, I went to high school at St. Thomas Military Academy, and as, as a high school in those days, if you uh, uh, went for four years and graduated, when you're 21 years old, you get a commission in the reserves. Well, uh, three days, three year, uh, two or three years after I graduated, I was over in Germany trying to kill people and they were trying to kill me. I'm sure if my mother and dad knew that was gonna happen, we would have gone to some other high school, but that, that's, the way, <laughs> that's the way it worked out. Uh, so how did I enter the military? Well, I graduated in, in uh, uh, 1941, June of 1941. And uh, the war started in uh, December. January. De December. January, December 7th, 1941. Uh, at the time I graduated, you had to wait until you're 21 years old to get a commission. Now today you have to graduate from college and, and be smarter and bigger and all that sort of thing, but the rule was until when you got to be 21 you got a commission. Well the war came on December 7th, 41, so they changed the rules, they'll take any of us, so a lot of us were 18 and 19 years old and we got commissions in the army and I was 19 and they called me in. And my, my first job was to train recruits down in Camp Robinson, Arkansas. And uh, I was to train them about, about the Army. The only trouble was I'd never been in the Army. And <laughs> so <laughs> that was a little bit of a drawback. Uh, now, I'll probably go start hunting through my notes, and then you'll really have some uh, vacant time here, but I hope not. Uh, when I entered the military, well, I entered the military when they called me in in uh, 19, uh, early in 1943. And I was sent down to Camp Robinson, Arkansas to train these recruits. Uh, uh, and I, I was a second lieutenant in the infantry. Uh, now I have to read my... Uh, well, I don't, some of you people may not know what ROTC meant. It meant Reserve Officers Training Corps, and there's a way a lot of these young people, such as, such as myself, got commissions. And uh, I guess it was, a, it was a, an honor to be a second lieutenant in the infantry, but it turns out it was a very risky business. And I, I've written a book about it. Uh, well, uh, I was, uh, I was called in in, uh, in early 1943, and I went down to Camp Robinson and was telling people about the Army, something I didn't know much about, but the, the, I must give the Army some credit. They sent me to the infantry school at Fort Benning, Georgia, which was a three-month uh, uh, assignment to, and I, I, let, let me quote what I said here, if I can find it. And if Don doesn't stop me for a second, uh, well. That was to make you a, a gentleman and a scholar, right? Yeah, well, I, I, a little of either. Well, <laughs> at any rate, I, I, my comment was that at Fort Benning, they, they told junior officers how to behave as junior officers, uh, 
something like that. But the line was better that I've written down, but I can't find it now. Uh, but I did go through the infantry school at Benning, which was very important. And uh, then after D-Day, June 6, 1944, uh, there was a big need for junior officers. They're the fellows who, unlike some of the colonels, but it's called <laughs> cannon fodder. It, 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 it's a risky job. Now, all the men that, uh, I was a, a rifle platoon leader, and I had 40 men under me, and their job was as risky as mine, and some would say riskier. Uh, but when you have to tell someone, you go over there and you might get killed, uh, but do it anyway, and that literally happened. But we won't go into that right now. Uh, well, uh, the way I got, I got there uh, to Europe, uh, it was by boat, and I don't have quite as good a good story as over here, but uh, I landed in, on New Omaha Beach, and I, I tell that story to people, and you know, Omaha Beach was the bloodiest be beach on, on D-Day, but the story weakens a little bit when I tell them I, I landed there on uh, the 2nd of August, 1944, about about two months after D-Day, so I was... <laughs> I was born in Minneapolis, October 13th, 1924, on Friday the 13th. My dad went to see me in the nursery, and the nurse brought out a little black baby. <laughs> and she took take a joke, and he laughed, and I told him, did you sure you got the right one? <laughs> Anyhow, I spent uh, all my time uh, up to the teenager that I got in. It was just in North Minneapolis, played football, boys vocational. We had our own baseball team and football teams in the neighborhoods where I was at. And uh, I remember my dad one day came in with tears in his eyes, and he says, Ken, they're going to take you. I said, why? He says, the Japs bombed Pearl Harbor. And I thought, how, you know? And I thought about that. And then we talked about it as guys, you know, as you play sports and all that. And you listen to it on the radio. But one day, a bunch of us guys, it must have been about 15 or more, that played together. We said, let's join up together. So we didn't know how to join up together. We went to the draft board. <laughs> they you don't get where you want to go there. <laughs> <laughs> and so we went there, and then a, a few weeks later, they sent us these welcome papers, you know, and, and we went down to the armory, you know, the big armory down there in, what, that 6th six, Street or someplace? Minneapolis, yeah. Yeah, in Minneapolis, and there we took an oath, you know, all I remember hundreds of guys standing in there taking an oath to protect America. And then they bust this well, and I took my truck out here to Fort Snelling. So I was out here at Fort Snelling, stayed in these barracks, and right there, <laughs> you guys probably can remember, you know, they, if you got any time to blush or anything, you shouldn't get over that fast. <laughs> <laughs> he told us to strip all our clothes <laughs> and put them in some room, and there we were. You should see these, and you guys know it out, no. All sizes and shapes. <laughs> there was a lot of them. I seen one guy there. The poor guy felt sorry for him. He had almost like a catcher's mass uh, padding that went down and hung below his crotch. Must have been about this thick, great big thing. But they didn't take him, the four F. And, and I noticed that we went through the line, you know how they stab you in your arms and <laughs> give you shots <laughs> and vaccinations and some guys keeled over. And they did. And they had a big screen up and they had a cot, army cot there and they took them in. Some of them were the big guys too and there they were <laughs> laying there until they got over their shots. Of course she had pretty sore arms for quite a few days. But I remember after they, uh, they wanted to know where they're going to ship me, so they, they asked, uh, what, what did you, your hobbies and what did you like to do? I said, I raised homing pigeons. <laughs> and so they said, they're going to send me to the Signal Corps. <laughs> 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 
And so, but I remember one incident that happened before I got sent there. They had, you see these old street cards, you see you got a picture out here of these old street cards and it used to come out here to Fort Snelling. And I remember the day that I got a chance just to go home, the crowd of guys pushing so hard to get on the streetcar, I thought, wow, I bet you they could hold me. So I lifted my legs up and they carried me right to the streetcar. <laughs> That's how hard they were pushing to get, couldn't wait to get home or wherever they were gonna go. Well, in a day or so, got on some train, you know how they give you your orders and you bring you to the depot and then you get on and, they, and I was sent to Camp Crowder, Missouri. Well, that's a signal corps camp. Well, when, I, when they saw that I was just a young guy, because most of the guys that raise pigeons, you know, they get in the racing clubs and they know really what they're doing, even though I had smart pigeons and could they fly back home. I wasn't in a racing club, so naturally they took these older men who was racing them. So then they found out that in my records that I also was uh, taking up mechanics at Boys Vocational. So they says, we need mechanics. So they sent me to the me mechanic school and tore apart motors and all the things like that. And then after that training was over, oh, but they said, do you drive? I remember, I don't have a driver's license. <laughs> you can be a mechanic and you have to handle this equipment. So <laughs> I always remember the driving class. They got in the truck, they said, double clutch it. Double clutch, I didn't even know hardly what a clutch was, you know. <laughs> and then I found out later, you push the clutch in once and you let it to neutral and you push it in again when you shift, you know, but they didn't know nothing. And I wasn't very good. I jerked it good, you know. <laughs> if you ever went, <laughs> when you let out the clutch and feed the gas. And <laughs> everything I did was wrong. First the sergeant went with me, <laughs> didn't pass. Then the lieutenant went with me, didn't pass. In fact, I killed the truck right in the middle of a, of a corner. <laughs> we weren't supposed to stop there and I got out there. Whew, so here I was, no driver's license, but I'm a mechanic now and I have to handle vehicles. So they send me down to, oh, by the way, this was in one of the famous states of Missouri. That's where I was, Camp Crowder, Missouri. It was quite a <laughs> hole from there on down, it's nothing but hot, sticky, muggy weather. So I was sent to Louisiana. <laughs> Couldn't get rid of these beautiful states of ours. <laughs> and there I was in the 92nd signal battalion. And so they brought me in the mo motor pool. So there in the motor pool, it was, an, it was an easy job, you know, changing oil and greasing and changing tires and little things like that. But, but I, I didn't uh, really care for the conversations that went on there. And so I, I asked, uh, was a captain, if I could get transferred. I said, the guys are nice and all that, but I'm not used to all the cussing and talking about women, so I'd much rather not. So they said, okay, they needed a driver in a, <laughs> a driver again. <laughs> and so uh, to be a messenger, a motor messenger. But this time I got in a two and a half ton truck I just drove it, just like, like it was an old timer. And then they gave me a, a license so I could drive up to a 10 ton truck, which was the big tow trucks that they had there. So that's how I, I got in a signal corps. And there's where I, I learned how to drive really fast as you can go. And because I got scared driving with some of these guys that said and holding on real hard as they went. And I, later on, I found out I was driving the same way. <laughs> which came in handy, especially when I got into Europe, because that's how I drove, fast as I could go. <laughs> so after, the, after this uh, experience down in Louisiana, I had a, well, I should tell you this one little story. I was a, a motor messenger, and we had so many, I think we had seven, eight guys, and two in a Jeep to bring messages around, and we, we serviced the two armies that was fighting each other, and we was neutral. So one Saturday morning, everybody fell out and they all waiting to get their passes to go to town. And uh, Master Sergeant says, uh, 
we need a volunteer to bring some messages to some place. Who's willing to do it? Well, I was one of the youngest guys there, but, and I don't know who would do it. And all I looked around, none of these old guys, they could hardly wait. They had their passes. I says, I will. He says, Krieger, go get the Jeep. The rest of you guys fall out with full field packs. We're going on a 15-mile hike. <laughs> <laughs> and I followed them. <laughs> you can imagine the looks I got from some. <laughs> well, from, from there, uh, they, they were going to camp, let's see, Camp Maxie, Texas. This was, we were in Camp Polk down there. And lo and behold, if they didn't choose me to drive uh, first lieutenant from headquarters and headquarters company to Camp Maxi to line up for the whole 92nd Signal Battalion, you know, where the big barracks were they're going to be. So here I am, chosen again. I thought, my, my God's really favoring me with kind of choice jobs, you know. <laughs> and I remember driving it through Texas, terrific speeds. Texas had a speed limit of 40 miles an hour, and the rest of the states were 35. But they <laughs> knocked it up one more, I mean, five more hours faster. So I get there to Camp Maxi, and the officer gets me billeted with some of the listed men, and he went with the officers. And so each day we waited till the whole uh, battalion came. And then after it came, I parked my Jeep by headquarters company. And I became their driver, just like that. <laughs> <laughs> and one day, I wasn't there. I was on, put on KP. And, and when they found out about that, that was the last of my ever having KP again. <laughs> All I had to do was sit there and wait till the sergeant came out and, or the lieutenant and drove them to town wherever they wanted to go. I did it. It was a rough, really rough choice, you know. Well, how did the Boy, the rest had to drill and do all kinds of stuff that I didn't. <laughs> Tell us how the 92nd got over to Europe. Okay, they got, they got in Europe by convoy. And I remember it took quite a few days. They lined up this convoy and we had to go through Torpedo Alley and all this. And, and as we traveled, uh, finally got going good. As you know, well, a lot of you guys are on ship. Guys get pretty sick, and it was really big swells. Some of them must have been 20, 30 feet high, and everybody was sick as a dog. Everybody had white faces and black whiskers. Nobody shaved, you just walking around. Uh, <laughs> and then you'd see them, uh, you know, belching here and there and all over the place. <laughs> and then I remember at the mess hall, it's chest high. How many remember that? if you're on a ship with a bunch of guys and you have to walk along with your tray, but then every now and then somebody will barf <laughs> in one of the lines, making everything delicious. You know? <laughs> but I managed to hold all mine down, even though sometimes I think I heaved up green foam. I don't know where it comes from. <laughs> I was pretty sick. But I couldn't stand the hole. I think I was next to the top in one of these bunks and the guys was heaving all over and I couldn't hardly stand the stink and they'd, they'd wash it off with pens oil. <laughs> and I, oh. So I ended up volunteering for the, the gun crew on the 37 millimeter aircraft uh, gun. So, and this, this was way up high, I remember it was up really high and then it was right down below there was a big mesh screen that went all the way to the boiler room. And so the hot air came up because we were going across in the winter time. In December, that it's cold. And that's where I stayed. I slept up there. I didn't go back down to my bunk. I couldn't stand the smell. When, when was that, Ken? When, Part, when did 43. you go? You went over in December of yeah. so, uh, winter of 43 then? Yeah. Well, I'm uh, really Midwestern. I was born in Omaha, Nebraska. And uh, went to Nebraska University. And... Uh, thought I was going to be a pre-law student. I was a pre-law student. And uh, then I got uh, drafted when I was 18. And uh, uh, they had a, a program back then. I suppose many of you had it too. Uh, uh, they had um, ASTP, Advanced Training, and uh, 
I applied for that and I, I, I kept delaying getting into the infantry and uh, I went to college uh, in Maryville College in Tennessee as, as an, actually as an air cadet then and then when they abandoned the program of air cadets I went, I was sent back into the infantry. Probably too, uh, uh, it was probably correct because my feet were so big that I don't think I could have ever gotten into a plane. <laughs> <laughs> But, you, you were uh, six foot four at that time? Pardon me? You were six foot four? I was six foot five and a half. Five and a half. Yeah. So I was, uh, I, I, I was um, actually, my army life began when, okay. Yeah. Um, the army did uh, some strange things, uh, as all of us know, we do things. Okay. And... Uh, I, I was um, in advanced army training program in college and they decided to abandon the program because they needed more infantry foot soldiers and they formed an infantry division made up entirely of college graduates and uh, ASTP guys and uh, we were formed into the 66th division and uh, the, they brought old line army non-coms and officers to train these college kids. We were all in college, uh, the, all the buck privates were. And uh, we met uh, down first at Camp Rucker, Alabama. And as we got this instruction, we'd sit back there on the ground listening to them and we'd correct their English <laughs> as they <laughs> talking. And, 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 <laughs> It was there was there was just a little bit of cleavage between the uh, the, the the buck privates and, and it, but it was a really a fan, uh, uh, it was a lot of fun because a cultural we, shock we didn't take it too seriously and they they were very serious and then when when they discovered that we were taking this very seriously they really got tough and uh, so it was a, it was a very interesting training experience and. I ended up uh, in uh, Company E, 262nd Infantry Regiment, and um, I think largely because of my size, I was made a sergeant immediately. <laughs> and uh, I, I, do you want, we were sent into, uh, do you want to? Go to England and then we'll stop yeah. there. We, were, we uh, were first sent to England and uh, we had a great time in England. I, lo I love England, and if I had another place where I would live, it would be France or England. And uh, we, we, uh, I found that most of the time, up until the time I got into combat, I was having a great time. <laughs> and and uh, but we we uh, were sent in. Uh, we were formed in the 66th Division, and uh, we were brought over on a uh, from uh, England to France. On no, let, let's not let's not do that one yet. Okay. Let's not do that one yet. Yeah. But but I I do want to point out one thing to the people here. You notice he's wearing his Ike jacket. And he made a comment, he said, I had a little trouble getting into it tonight. But I did wear it. <laughs> uh, oh, okay, I, Bill. I felt it was quite an achievement to uh, wear an uh, Eisenhower jacket at this, at this stage of life. Bill Hoffman uh, uh, is representing his father tonight, and, and you'll see why in, in the second go around of questions. Can you talk about your father, how he got in the military, and, and did he go through the ASTP program also? As, as I understand it, he did, and I, I recognize Camp Rucker. Uh, he, he was there also in Alabama. Um, but I, as far as, I'm not sure when he crossed uh, over to England. W when did you arrive in England? In spring of '44. Yeah, yeah. That's that's about the same time that my father was there. Yeah. Okay. Spring of '44. Right. Okay. Yeah. But they didn't cross until December 24th. And your dad was in what uh, regiment? My dad was in the 766th Ordnance Outfit. Okay. Right. Yeah. 
He was okay. a, the chief machinist in his, in his unit. Janique, tell us about uh, your uh, father and kind okay. of getting into REN. Well, I wasn't in the Army like everybody else, but my father was. And in 1939, the war started for me because we were in a... We were Speak closer to it. We mic. were sent in the Maginot Line because my father was in garrison in the Maginot Line. He was directing a, a cannon as a, as a captain. And uh, so we, in the middle of the night one day, the French, French soldiers, they come inside of the, knocking at our door to say, you have to leave immediately because the Germans are coming. So we were kind of, uh, we didn't have a car to, to go any place, but a neighbor said, well, I could take you to uh, Rouen in, in Normandy because I can drive a car and then you can come along with us and then from there you can go to uh, Brittany where I was born. I was born in Rennes and my grandmother lived in Rennes. So we, uh, we uh, took a bus from Rouen to, uh, to uh, uh, Rennes and then we, we stayed at my grandmother's house during the war in 1945. And, uh, but, uh, but then a few weeks later, um, we got a telegram from my father, who was in the Maginot line when we left, because we had to leave uh, him because he was there. And uh, we left with uh, only our clothes on our back, that's all. And so when, uh, when we arrived in Rennes, we heard, we heard that my father had been taken prisoner of war by the German. And, uh, he was taken on the 24th of June, 1940. And uh, at that time, we, um, we were kind of sad, but uh, he, he gave us hope because he was pretty strong. And, uh, um, but he was taken prisoner of war. So we decided uh, uh, to stay at my grandmother. And then we met, uh, we, we met the German uh, <clears throat> after that, the, the Hitler's army, really, because um, they, were, they were in Rennes when we came as a refugee from uh, Alsace-Lorraine. We were, we were coming up in Rennes, and then the German were there, too. They were coming in June, too, like we were. And so they were arresting people from uh, innocent people, like I saw a, a French officer uh, go in to the, get his newspaper, and a German would come with his motorcycle and he will push him inside and say, come inside, and the French uh, would say, no, I don't want to go, let me tell my wife at least, and they will say nine, 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 and they would push him inside of the sidecar, and then he was prisoner for that day, I guess. And then, um, so we decided, um, you know, we should uh, we should do something something else, but we still stay in Rennes. And then there was a big bombing that night on the 17th of June, I think, 1940. It was a very terrible um, uh, German German uh, bombing. Uh, we saw three airlines coming down to Rennes with a uh, swastika on their tail or something like that, and they bomb. We heard a bombing, but we didn't know where it was. We found out it was a station. They bombed the station in Rennes, uh, the railroad station, where there were two, um, two, some people who were there with like refugees on the train and uh, some soldiers on the train. And then there was an explosion uh, coming up too because there was a train full of explosion. So um, we heard that there was about 2,000 to 3,000 people who died that night because of the German. And uh, I went outside uh, that night. I remember going outside, and uh, I saw a young man come in from that uh, railroad station. He had blood on his shirt and blood on his hand, and he, he was telling me, I just came back from the station, the railroad station, and it's terrible because the full avenue of, this, of the gar station is, is, uh, is completely destroyed, and you see on the tree uh, limb and leg and head of people who have been killed by that explosion. They said that explosion lasted 24 hours. And he said it was terrible because they were crying and, and asking for help, and nobody could rescue them because they were completely blocked with that explosion. And so um, for us, it was kind of uh, sad. We were refugees at my grandmother, and we felt like move again to another town. But we stayed for a few, a few times more bombing. We, we had more bombing later on. 
And so we decided to, to uh, after a few bombing, we decided to go to Guipel, where my grandfather was born. It was north of uh, Rennes, closer to Fougères, closer to Normandy, near the town of Fougères. And so that's what we did for, for uh, you know, during the occupation. Errol, uh after you broke out at Avranche with the 6th and moved into Brittany, uh, tell us uh, your memories in that uh, August period of 1944. Don, I was going to digress just a you little bit. You digress. Just a little bit. People ask where I served or what unit I was in, and I say an armored division. And right away they say, oh, are you in a tank? And the answer is no. And so I will explain to you that what an armored division consists of. It will be very brief. Three tank battalions, three artillery battalions, three armored infantry battalions, and then one each of these. Reconnaissance, signal, tank destroyer, anti-aircraft, Engineer Battalion, Ordnance Maintenance Battalion, and Medical Battalion. Now when you throw all those 16 battalions together, you've got a standard armored division. It's pretty self-sufficient, self-contained, and very mobile. There's 10,670 men, and here's some of the stuff. 365 tanks, 500 half-tracks and armored cars, 600 trucks, and 450 jeeps. That's not over 1,900 vehicles. So by and large, we didn't walk unless the vehicle was shot out under us. And if it was and we could still walk, then we walked or found another vehicle. Now, uh, the 6th Armored Division landed beginning uh, July 18th. And you can see why it's that late, because that's one division to get to France and Normandy on LSTs, LST, landing ship tank. Each one of those ships is about as long as a football field, and I don't know, a couple hundred feet wide. All, as you loaded, loaded in England, you backed everything on. When you hit the beaches, you drove off. And we drove off, my battalion that I was in, drove off two days later on July 20th. We drove off in about three feet of water. We had cosmoline all over the engine. We had a air intake on the carburetor about eight feet tall, exhaust pipe, about eight feet up in the air, prepare, prepared to go into deeper water. <clears throat> so we hit Normandy, St. Maryglis, Utah Beach, on the 20th of July at three in the morning. Not a shot was fired. This happens to be the same day that the major attempt on Hitler's life took place. J July 20th in the afternoon when they tried to bomb him and kill him. It's just a little bit of coincidence of history. Uh, once we hit shore, we dispersed a couple hundred yards between each vehicle. Uh, we took all that cosmoline off and all that junk we didn't need anymore. And uh, one week later, we were committed to the breakout. At that point, we found out we're part of the 6th Armored Division. And uh, that's, that's the moment that the 777th became part of the 6th Armored Division. And from that day, about July 27th, we were in a frontline combat situation for 221 days, clear up through the bulge and chasing the Germans back into Germany. Uh, now I'm getting to Arachis. Sorry, Don. Um, with that explanation, 
I often like to say that as an anti-aircraft outfit, we were playing defense on one of the greatest offensive units, the 6th Armored, the 4th Armored, strictly offense. But we were playing defense. And we started, my, in fact, I was in a command half track. We had a single ring mount 50 on the right side next to the driver. And my gunner shot down the very first plane that our battalion got. And I would say this was about July 27th, 28th. Uh, we proceeded to shoot down 110 more before the end of the war. Uh, going through Avranches, well, I can name some cities. We were the right-hand division going down Normandy before we got to Avranches. Places like Plouve, Plouve, La Haye du Pitz or Pou or whatever. You fought, fought, fought French. Uh, Coutances. <laughs> All these were cities on the way down to Avranches. We got to Avranches, I call it, in the dark. And we're in convoy, and you're trying to follow the vehicle ahead of you and not get too far away, not lose them, and not run into them. And we had some at least one of our captains was standing at a major intersection and told us, turn right here and go across the bridge. I understand reading later, uh, when I say we, I'll talk about the 6th Armored Division, but I understand both the 4th and the 6th crossed basically that one bridge in about 24 hours. So we're talking, well, I'm talking 1,900 vehicles. Uh, I know the 4th Armored was organized the same Sorry. way. And this was one of the major feats of the war. Uh, we were in, from Avranches on, we were heading for Brest. Our mission was to capture the port of Brest. And we were in basically two columns advancing up the right side of Brittany as you're heading toward Brest. Strangely enough, we didn't have too much action because a lot of the Germans were going the same way we were. <laughs> and they wanted to get back into Brest to defend it and some security of a, a real fortress. And we were trying to get there to capture it. And just to give you an idea, in seven days, by August 7th, uh, we had traveled within four miles of the heart of Brest. Now that's 230 miles. Once we got to Brest, uh, General Middleton and General Patton didn't see eye to eye. General Patton didn't like the whole idea of going to Brittany in the first place. He wanted to go to Berlin. <laughs> and he, so he estimated, Patton estimated there were somewhere around 10,000 troops defending Brest. I think we found out later there were more like 30,000. But Middleton, called off the armored division, us, because the armored division, they act like a halfback on a football team. They are very maneuverable. If you run into an object too tough, you go around it. You don't butt your head against it. And Middleton didn't think that the armored division should be trapped in the canyons of a city that was well defended. So we were pulled back and told to wait and wasted a couple of days. And some of the art, ex experts say we could have captured the city if we went straight in. Uh, the historian can tell you more about it. But this is what happened. We were there. We're a little bit like the farmer's dog who is mean and he chases a car and he catches one and he doesn't know what to do with it. <laughs> I think that's what the 6th Armored did. When, when did Brest finally uh, 
We were sure. relieved by an infantry division, and it took them about five weeks to catch. How many? Four. Four weeks. Four infantry divisions. Four infantry divisions. The historian is telling me. Um, took four infantry divisions to capture it. I think about a month to five weeks after we were pulled back. And uh, from there we were sent actually to, uh, to Lorient to relieve the 4th Armored Division. And they, their mission was to capture Lorient and that never did surrender, I understand. Well, the 4th and the 6th were Patton's two favorite divisions. The 4th was more famous. I think they had a better PR man. Uh, they were actually the ones that eventually broke through this encirclement at Bastogne. Uh, we were there, but we, surround, we bypassed Bastogne after a day and chased the Germans all the way back through the Siegfried Line across the Rhine River and across the uh, Mies River, I think it was called. Now, a little bit of what happened on that Avranches to Brest seven days. The days and the nights were the same. We never slept. We never quit moving. Several nights we had Germans chasing us. They were on all sides of us and German planes above us. And they seemed like they were 200 feet above us. And we had strict orders not to fire a shot because all those planes needed was two streams of tracers and they knew where the road was. But every time the convoy stopped, we bailed out of the half track and out as far as we could run, I was out of breath after about three, 400 feet. Flopped down in a field waited till the planes disappeared. I left a couple dents from my knees in the ground. Uh, our driver bailed out the left side and he ran right through a barbed wire fence. Never knew it was there. Uh, these are to illustrate your, your first test of combat. You're totally green, you're totally scared. Don't let anybody tell you otherwise. I'm thinking of an expression, but my wife is going. <laughs> <laughs> Ken Kruger has written his book also, and he was helped by Lee Berkman, who's in the second row here. Raise your hand, Lee. Th thank you for helping Ken with the book. Ken, real quickly, we're running behind, of course, <clears throat> okay. but uh, tell about some of your experiences in Brittany yeah. and getting messages between headquarters and signal battalion. That was my job. We worked right out of core headquarters. We had uh, a, closer. a message center where they could decode or decipher the messages and, and had to bring them to whatever fighting units that we were sent to. And uh, we had priority of the road. Messengers was number one, tanks were number two, generals were number three. That's how important it was. And he talked about the convoys. How would you like to go in and out and pass in these convoys trying to get to the places where you're supposed to bring the messages in the nighttime. Daytime was bad enough, and sometimes there would be two groups, another coming back, Red Ball Express, <laughs> headed for the beach to get a load of gas or whatever. And it, I'll tell you, it was a nerve-wracking job, and, and we drove just as fast as we could most of the time, because the faster we drove, we knew, because the Germans were spread all over when we first broke out there. You never know where you're going to run into them. Even Corps headquarters, they moved ahead and they, and they moved right into a big nest of Germans. They had to send the infantry in to wipe them out. Well, what really got me into the war stuff, because, see, we, we, we got in there about, uh, about 30 days later. They, one of our companies was sent in about one week ahead, one of the wire companies. They, they also brought the telephone places to all the different offices. That's what our, our office did. So every night the Germans came over and bomb, bombed us. We call them Bed Check Charlie because all there was is just so many roads in Normandy. And finally, when there was a breakthrough, they, they just bottlenecked down that way. Well, 
I got a message that I had to bring to Core Rear. Now, the Core Rear was above Avarantes. That's how I pronounce it, I don't know. And so it took off. It was in the daytime. We took off, and we get past Avarantes because they're supposed to be below them. We got there. They weren't there. So now we had to turn around and go all the way back through Avarantes up to where the, the Core Rear was. So as we're traveling along, I know that we got coming to Avarantes, Man, they had anti-aircraft all over the place because, see, they're in a hilly country there, and they had bridges there, and the Germans tried to bomb them out. In fact, we found out later the Germans had snipers even put along some of these ridges to shoot the guys in the front of the convoys to stop the convoys up. And most of the roads were all beat up and bombed, and they had to be filled almost every day. So here we are. We go through Avarantes, and we're pitch black now. We're flying down the road. And all of a sudden, two these big flares, and the guys know what flares are, they light up everything just so you can read a newspaper. And man, this is the first experience now I had of something happening. And man, I was all shook up. What should we do? The, the, the road was all lit up, everything was lit up. So we pulled off the road, and I covered my windshield in my Jeep, my buddy, and I, we got out, and I run and I lead by the hedgerows. And I remember to keep my hands covered, don't let my face show, because they say your reflection can. They can see, did a lot of this, praying, <laughs> praying. I didn't know where my buddy was. So these, these bombers come, you could hear them, and they lined up different colored flares. One guy was trying to shoot them down with a, a machine gun every now and then. You get the tracer bullets above the flare, and down would come the old flare. And then, then the bombs started to come. Man, right after, one after another, you could hear them blowing up all around us. And, and man, I'm laying there, God, watch over my buddy. Oh, I don't know where he is. And I was praying, please protect this, Lord. And finally, they, they quit. And so I got up, I said, Melvin, where are you, Melvin? I'm over here. Here he had laid in the, the culvert and the ditch. He had climbed in and stuck his head <laughs> in the culvert. And here he was a, a married guy, about 27 or 28, and I'm just a 19-year-old dummy, you know. <laughs> And he had a great big hunk of, of the road or something. He had wrapped him in, the, in his legs and that stuff was sticking out. And I was covered with dirt. And so we get on our back in our Jeep and away we take off for core rear. And the empty says, you can't go back down that road. So now after giving the messages to the, them, we picked up theirs. And now we had to drive into Brest farther to the next town because we had to make a big triangle. So as we're driving to this other town, we get to it just before we pulled out into the road, an MP, he was standing in the corner in the shadow, he said, watch out. There's a sniper down there. He keeps shooting at us, see, because the Germans had dropped snipers all along through these hills. And this, this one was in the town. And, and the moon was out. And I was driving. And, and we had these big uh, mail bags. That's what we carried most of our stuff. In. And we had them piled really high. And I remember I was down so low, I was looking through the spokes of my steering wheel. And, I, and moonlit night, my Jeep used to go from 60 up to the zero mark. So I don't know how fast that was, but that's how I used to make the bugger go. So we just flew down that road. I don't know if they shot us or not. And as we're driving, getting near an avalanches, I see a great big fire up there. The, the Germans some way must have known there was some dump there, and they had blown that up. And now we're, we're flying up this, this bombed out road, even it was kind of rough, and the great big tall trees making big shadows over the road. But and every now and then there would be no trees. And all of a sudden where the no trees was, and some guy started to shoot at us from up here in this hill. I, then I stepped on the gas really hard. <laughs> and what did I do? I hit a bombed out place, but it had been built and you know, covered up some. And I almost went off the cliff, I'll tell you. I was so glad to get through, get back to Avarantes and get back to, it's the only place I ever dug a foxhole. The reason I had dug a foxhole, the day before, 15 German planes came out and they headed for the ocean which wasn't very far away. Then he turned around, came back, and was spraying everything. Man, and I had dug a hole through the hedgerow, and I jumped through that hedgerow, and I had my old Thompson sub, and he's, this German plane came over, and the old guy was looking around, and the smoke was coming out, but whew, he was gone. 
So that's when I that's when I had my only foxhole in the whole war. From that time, I just slept wherever I could, wherever. And then besides, uh, about my book, I met a sweet little French gal there. And read all about it. If you bring you <laughs> She's going to talk about her memory of being liberated by the Americans at this point. When we heard from the BBC that the American had come to Brittany because of the breakthrough to Avranches, so we, uh, we were so happy because it was a message of hope for us. And uh, my mother and I, we walk uh, 27 kilometers to go from Guipel, the village where we were, to uh, saint aubin aubigny d'Aubigny. That's where the Americans were. The first, the first uh, American came to saint aubin d'Aubigny. So we wanted to see them, and we never seen an American in our life before. And uh, everybody was so grateful to see them, and they were thanking them for what they were doing for liberation. And, and uh, they were bringing them cognac and wine and everything they could find, you know. And then we were happy to see they had prisoner of war right behind them on the jeep. And they looked like a general with big decoration, and they looked so serious with their sword and everything, but they were prisoner of war. So we were happy about that. And then uh, later on, um, uh, later on, it seems like even though we were in a small village like Gipel, we thought we were refugees in a, in a small little town where we wouldn't experience any problem. But uh, as the liberation was coming closer and the war coming to an end, uh, the, we were one night a German knock at the door about 12 o'clock in the night, and they were knocking so loud, and we, nobody wanted to get up because we live in a small little house and. My grandmother said she will open the door, and so she opened the door. About 50 German came in the house and asking us. We couldn't understand it. German, but they were asking us some direction and looking for my father. And I, we say he was in Germany, prisoner, looking. My mother was there, and they wanted her to go with them to show them direction. But I think they were running out because they, the war was coming out, and they. Yeah, but anyway, uh, then we said, no, my mother can't go. and. And so they, they say water, 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 and we knew that mean water. And so we went, we gave them some water from the wells. Uh, we didn't use that water for us, but we didn't like the Germans, so we gave them water. <laughs> <laughs> we gave them the water from the well. We kept the good water for us, you know. <laughs> and, and, then, and then so they left. They say after they got the water, then they left. And they didn't have any transportation. They looked tired. Their clothes were bad. I think they were running away from the Americans someplace. And so um, we were grateful and blessed because nothing happened to us. We could have been killed or something, but they didn't do it. So uh, we still are alive. <laughs> and uh, another time, uh, another time in Brittany, as the liberation was coming to a close. Uh, we could see, even in that little village, a lot of American uh, truck or jeep passing by. And uh, they would always do the sign like that V, uh, victory. So we were designed to, we were waiting every day for them to come by. And then we will sit on the edge of the, of the road and, and then we will uh, uh, pick up flower of the color of the flag, like a poppy and a bachelor button and, and a daisy. We would make a big bouquet for them and throw it in their jeep, and they were so happy. Sometimes they would stop, and we would give them some egg and, and, and tomato because they didn't have any fresh food like that. And then uh, some of the time, we would say, swim gum, swim gum, swim gum, and they will throw us some package of swim gum and, 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 and uh, chocolate, too. And we really like that, too. So we like the American more than the German, <laughs> for sure. <laughs> and, um, but anyway, what was I going to say? Um, I forgot what I was going to say. Well, uh, Janique, I'm going to ask you a question. Uh, your father lasted through the German POW camp, and he lived until, 19, uh, until 2004. Four. Yeah. Support for this program provided by viewers like you. Thank you. Additional support provided through the Catherine B. Anderson Fund of the St. Paul Foundation. Upcoming roundtable topics can be found at www.mn-ww2roundtable.org.
production services provided by Barrows Productions.